So tēnā koutou katoa. It gives me great pleasure this evening to introduce Rajesh Nairn this evening. Raj is an interventional and structural cardiologist located at the Waikato Hospital and Southern Cross Heart Institute. He completed his specialty training in England, Australia and Denmark before beginning consult consulting in Waikato almost 10 years ago. He has performed over 300 TAVI, transcatheter aortic valve implantation procedures, including establishing new delivery sites. Raj is the Deputy Chair of the Cardiac Intervention and Device Committee at Pharmac and is the co-founder of Structural Heart Disease Asia-Pacific, which aims to bring together all disciplines. Tonight he is presenting a webinar on long-term implications of undiagnosed heart disease and questioning how can we encourage our high-risk patients back into our clinics. And I will now hand you over for this evening's webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, Ms. Raj, thanks for the introduction. Um, thanks for asking me to speak about uh, COVID and the cardiovascular disease, uh, the impact of uh, the virus uh, in cardiology. So, the 31st of December last year, uh, pneumonia of unknown cause was reported first in Wuhan, China. And uh, it was uh, declared as a public health emergency of international concern in, at the end of January this year. And by the 11th of February 2020, um, it was uh, termed as COVID, coronavirus disease 2019. It was declared a pandemic by the WHO on the 11th of March 2020. And since then, numerous publications have come across the world in uh, leading medical journals about COVID and its impact to not only cardiovascular system, but the entire uh, human body. The SARS coronavirus 2 uh, is an uh, enveloped virus with non-segmented single-stranded RNA. It's thought to be uh, originating, uh, originating from bats. And the portal of entry to humans is most likely mediated by uh, angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 receptor. It's a systemic infection, viral infection. And specialists across all disciplines are involved in care. It is a new virus, so we are still learning from this, and certainly appears to be a multi-system involvement. Therefore, it needs a close partnership amongst uh, the healthcare workers and specialists from across the um, specialties, and policymakers, uh, managers uh, for a best clinical outcome. In terms of infection, the, in, in terms of mortality rate, it, it is slightly above uh, the seasonal flu uh, in terms of from 0.1% for seasonal flu and 3.8% mortality uh, from what we know so far. So why did it become a pandemic so fast? It's certainly more infectious. The lower Case fatality means the virus spreads from person to person rather than killing its host and therefore ending the chain. It has a long asymptomatic infectious phase. And complications and death happens far later after the first uh, point of infection. And there are people who say you don't test it. And this is the latest. When you test, you find something that's wrong with people. If you don't test, there will be few cases. That meant whatever estimate we have probably is a gross underestimate. And this is the latest for almost very close to 5 million people in the world are infected and just over 300,000 people, people have died from the coronavirus. We are lucky to be in New Zealand because New Zealand is probably in the green graph where we have very strong epidemic control early on, and therefore the chances of infection spreading has come low compared to other parts of the world. But what is interesting is the prevalence of cardiovascular disease in patients with COVID is high. If then there are risks for cardiovascular disease, the chances are patients can 
get potentially infected with COVID. And those patients who are in intensive care are more likely to have cardiovascular risk factors. Therefore, the risk of adverse events in patients who are, with, who are positively in, 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 confirmed with COVID tend to be higher if they have pre-existing cardiovascular disease or potential risk factors. So there are direct effects and indirect effects of COVID. So I'm going to go through very quickly what are the direct effects and indirect effects. The true magnitude of its effects will probably come to light much later as new data comes in every day. So what are the direct effects of COVID? The direct effect of COVID has particular concern for, for cardiologists. And what we have known from, what we have understood from studies is troponin elevation happens from myocardial injury, from acute coronary syndrome, or severe hypoxia. But patients with higher cardiac troponin elevation seems to have worse prognosis. So troponin elevation is an independent predictor of death. And that is seen from across uh, the, the, the Western countries where the systemic data is available. In hospitalized patients, cardiac arrhythmia was noted in almost 17% of patients. And the, the reasons for cardiac arrhythmia could, could potentially be metabolic disarray, hypoxia, neurohormonal stress, or inflammatory stress. Heart failure is also common. Up to about 17% of patients tend to have heart failure. That could be new onset of heart failure or decompensation of pre-existing heart failure after COVID. Venous thromboembolism is also common, particularly pulmonary embolism. In, luckily, children are, are not as, as much affected as adults. However, there is, there is emerging evidence to, to, to suggest Kawasaki-like disease is, um, is, being, is being reported and picked up in Italy. The issue with Kawasaki disease is that it, it may have late uh, uh, complication, particularly around coronary vasculature in almost 8% of affected patients. Numerous drugs have been given for coronavirus, and many of them have cardiovascular disease, uh, side effects. And of course, there are some medications which have received undue uh, media attention too. The combination of azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine appears to have some effects in some patients. There are numerous international trials now going on. Both can prolong QT intervals and predispose patients to life-threatening arrhythmia. And indirect effects of COVID is seen over a period of time. More so because many of the patients who are coming to hospital during the lockdown period where there is a serious activity of COVID or COVID-related illness, appear to be staying at home. Therefore, it is pr proposed that there are untreated cardiovascular disease out in the community, which could potentially come back to hospital. And I'll show you a few graphs of that. The true magnitude of, of COVID-19 effects may never be quantified. And this because of the risk of underestimation. Certainly the data so far suggests patients with ST elevation myocardial infarction have not turned up to hospital. For whatever reason, all the hospitals, coronary care units are not busy as it used to be. And data from the US suggests almost 38% decrease in ST elevation myocardial infarction. And European data is also similar, 30% decline 
uh, in Italian hospitals with both uh, ST elevation and non-ST ST elevation myocardial infarction. Because patients don't tend to get to hospital, there is a concomitant increase in fatality rates. The sickest who survive end up in hospital. So the late presentation result in patients in, with cardiogenic shock and mechanical complications like ventricular septal rupture or acute myocardial, uh, acute uh, mitral regurgitation. And these patients don't do very well uh, once they are in hospital. This is data from a Spanish hospital, where again, we can see almost 40 to 80% uh, reduction in uh, cath lab activity. And there, are, and there could be potential. Uh, there could be several reasons why there is why we see a, a lack of uh, interest in uh, in seeking ca cardiac care. The patients don't want to go to hospital, and and physicians are focused on COVID, and and there is a delay in diagnosis or even misdiagnosis, and there is a lack of infrastructure or a delay in, in ambulance, ambulances getting to um, patients who actually need help. So the actual number of patients who suffer from uh, acute coronary syndrome and die before they get to hospital may never be known. But what is also worrying is this pattern has been also seen in other cardiovascular emergencies like heart failure, pulmonary embolism, aortic dissections, there's significant decline in hospital admission. So there must be, these, these patients must be out there in the community. In Waikato Hospital itself, we have seen a significant decline in inpatients who come to hospital. And the cath lab activity has also reduced significantly uh, during the, the lockdown period we had in New Zealand. The, the, if you look at the blue graph, the, uh, acute, the rate of acute myocardial infarction has significantly fallen from February to March to April. And that, uh, of course, uh, translates into the procedure volume we see in the cath lab has come down in March and April, which are usually uh, the higher uh, volume months. The acute, uh, acute hospital and elective procedures volume had come down during the lockdown period. And if you look at cardiothoracic surgery in orange, that also has significantly reduced, there was very little activity in, uh, in at the hospital. And this has proportionately come down for Maori and Pacific patients in, in New Zealand. And this is again, uh, data from our, our Waikato hospital. So we, when, when we see less number of Maori and Pacific patients turning up to hospital to, uh, to, uh, to uh, seek uh, hospital level care, one should be worried that the, these are patients who have a uh, higher risk of uh, cardiovascular disease and higher risk of mortality uh, in the community. This highlights the need to make the public aware to call for help when needed. There has to be operational guidelines and more importantly, proactive co collaboration amongst healthcare professionals like primary care, secondary care, and tertiary care facilities. And that is so crucially important. So several considerations for healthcare workers are also are, is, is key. This, this graph is quite, uh, quite significant. There are several of my, my own uh, colleagues and friends in Europe uh, and the US have died due to coronavirus. Almost 198 physicians as of April 9th. And there's certainly very little statistics available for allied healthcare, and that's also worrying. And mo much of the uh, death is, was attributed to the lack of uh, personal protection, uh, production equipments uh, in, in, even in, in the most modern uh, and developed countries, in the, like the US, for example. So this is going to stay with us uh, as for, for a considerable period of time. 
So, so the, the new norm will be the patients with confirmed COVID, probable COVID, or possible, virtually all patients will now be treated as possible cases. And that, of course, translates into significant change in how we operate in cath labs and theaters. For example, a patient who has COVID positive, who is confirmed to be COVID positive, it, take, it can take up to six hours for a procedure to get, get complete. Usually the procedure time is around two hours. With a COVID confirmed patient, it takes up to six hours. So you can see the impact of resources a confirmed patient can, um, can bring into the hospital, to the healthcare system. So we have to reorganize how we practice medicine. Uh, at, at the heights of uh, lockdown, there was very little teaching, for example. We did not do transesophageal echocardiography because that would have uh, increased the risk of aerosolization. Uh, even normal, normal echocardiography, which was considered as usual practice, people were scared to go uh, near pa patients who were probable uh, COVID because of the risk of infection. Uh, as I said uh, before, we will have ups and downs of, uh, of viral infection. This has collapsed global economy and changed the landscape of healthcare delivery. The effect of this will be seen waves and we will have to then learn, learn we need to learn and adapt how to surf uh, between these waves uh, to, so that uh, we can then uh, provide the best possible care for patients. So the new norm is where, how we, we collaborate and arrange logistics to treat patients who need our help the most. For example, we have a regional um, STEMI program, which we, have, we had to stop for a, for a few weeks, and now we have come back on board. We have learned lessons, and then we have streamlined this again. So patients with, with ST elevation MI right now will get shipped straight directly to a PCI capable center where you can get the best possible treatment. However, we are still performing for thrombolysis when patients can't get to a PCI capable hospital. The protocols and guidelines have been rewritten to allow the safest and the most effective treatment possible uh, when the patients have probable or possible COVID disease. And we are now relying more and more on non-invasive testing like CT angiography, uh, rather than invasive angiography to minimize the risk of COVID as infection and also spread amongst healthcare workers or from the transmission from patients to, um, to healthcare workers. Structural heart disease procedures like transcatheter aortic valve implantation, mitral clip procedures, left atrial appendage closure, ASD closure, atrial septal defect closure, balloon aortic valvuloplasty and mitral valvuloplasty, which was the norm in patients who needed this. We are now starting to rethink as to who will best benefit from, from treatment. So a lot of positive things have also come about after this, uh, after this pandemic. We are now able to treat patients. We have now streamlined difficult procedures of so what was regarded as complex procedures to minimally invasive strategies. Patients come in the morning, get the treat, get their, they are assessed over the phone be, before they come to hospital, and they get the treatment, and they are able to go home or to uh, a facilitated care home the next day or uh, the day after. So these pathways, clinical pathways, have been, we have completely rewritten clinical pathways and shared with our regional colleagues and primary care physicians to help streamline patient flow through the hospital. In other words, patients should not be in hospital level care unless they have to. The way we practice medicine has changed and probably will remain the new norm. The healing power of face-to-face -face visit and human touch are no longer considered as a privilege. Sadly, there are many clinical decisions 
are made on intuition due to lack of resources. We have also introduced new concepts such as telehealth and virtual clinics where we cardiologists, specialists are able to reach out to GPs over and or patients and have consultations directly. We're trying to get the remote monitoring in place and community nurse-led services are more active than ever before. We are also uh, introducing a new concept where there are laser Maori laser nurses in the community so that we can reach out to population who are most vulnerable. Our treatment has, is now focused for those who need it most. And we are now starting to consider the effect of treatment on prognosis versus effect of treatment on for purely for symptoms. Ultimately, we, we are mindful that this, we are working on a very tightly constrained public medical, public health system. And, and all the effects of COVID, whether it is direct or indirect, uh, we, we are able to provide care with resource constraints in mind. I'll finish off by saying, as both specialists and general practitioners and secondary care physicians, we have to work together and find creative ways to innovate and re-engage with our patients uh, to help um, promote cardiovascular health. Thank you. Wow, you were super speedy there, my goodness. <laughs> You have left yourself wide open to lots of questions this evening. So people, please feel free to use your Q&A function. Come along with all your questions, whether it's clever man. <laughs> and we'll see. Right. So we'll start with, we've got a couple of questions already for you. And so we've got, the first one we've got is asking about, do we need more cath labs in rural areas? So, um, the workforce in New Zealand is such that having cath labs in rural communities um, may not be the answer to our problem. Um, you're better off focusing highly specialized um, procedures in a tertiary center. And that data comes from uh, China, from Spain, from Italy, where patients are shipped across to a place where they can provide definitive treatment rather than a diagnostic procedure. And definitive treatment in New Zealand will, it will be um, coronary angioplasty rather than coronary angiography, which is a diagnostic treatment. So of course, uh, the increasing cath lab numbers is, uh, is, a, uh, is a welcome addition to the healthcare system. But again, would that, be, would that translate to a increased prognosis or increased number of patients who survive, uh, we are not sure yet. He says, um, what about a mobile cath lab? <laughs> yes. Uh, so we are now talking away from COVID. Okay? Uh, so if you're now talking about in expanding or um, uh, healthcare resources towards the community, absolutely. Mobile, uh, mobile cath labs, uh, was introduced in England uh, several, almost uh, two decades ago, and it is still uh, uh, considered as norm in, in England, for example. Uh, it is not as much uh, popular as it is in, um, in, in New Zealand, but uh, certainly for, uh, if we are able to uh, get services to the community, then that, that, is, that can only be good for the community. And going back to COVID, should all suspected COVID-19 patients get troponins initially done? Uh, I, I, think, I think that is a very, very uh, valid uh, uh, point. Um, we know if they are troponin positive, the chance of you getting out of hospital alive is, is small. So at least we can then preemptively treat patients um, uh, and uh, or I would say proactively treat these patients who have got troponin positive. Either they've got heart failure or they've got pulmonary embolism or some unknown cause, if it is not known, 
to suggest that this patient is at high risk of, um, of a serious adverse event. Therefore, yes, if, there is, if they have confirmed positive uh, COVID, for sure, a troponin, positive, a troponin test is, um, is recommended. And then we've got the new healthcare resources are starting to include web-based. How can we involve those who are technophobes? Yeah, so one of the other uh, good things that have come out of COVID is uh, a serious investment, at least a restructure of um, IS systems in the hospitals. When uh, I'm also a part of the health, National Health Informatics Leadership uh, uh, Network, and we have been calling out for uh, improved uh, IS and web-based uh, telehealth for years. And now all of a sudden, the hospital systems have turned uh, their focus uh, to IS and they are investing in uh, licenses and, uh, and the uh, softwares. The, to, to be fair, the world all, all over is uh, moving on to uh, or embracing uh, working from home, for example. It was almost unheard of for doctors. Now, the, the lockdown period, the, the department was divided into two. Half of us were at home and half of us were at hospital to decrease um, all of us getting uh, potentially contaminated together. So working from home is possible, uh, even for healthcare workers. Uh, so um, I, again, uh, this will be the new norm. Technology has not caught up with uh, this yet. The, such kind of uh, interactions uh, on, a, on a webinar is, is good. But if you were to ex um, expand this to include um, cardiothoracic meetings or high-risk meetings or uh, diagnostic angiography or echocardiography, technology has not caught up there yet. But it is, it is getting better. And then they'll give you, a, so we're now we've got, what are the waiting lists, wait, what are the waiting lists like in hospitals after COVID for things like echoes? <laughs> uh, uh, the echocardiography is a, is a problem across New Zealand. Uh, so even before COVID, um, you have seen media release uh, from different hospitals in New Zealand where patients have been waiting for almost a year. So again, as, as I said on the last slide, we have to innovate. In our department, uh, we have uh, got new portable machines where we are, uh, we are now writing protocols, how we can do a screening echo. Whereas previously, a echocardiogram would have taken an hour, we are now uh, writing protocols to, uh, to, to streamline echocardiography in 20 minutes. Therefore, and we are giving portable, um, Echo, echo machines to um, uh, our trainees, uh, to our uh, cardiologists, uh, to go out to the wards and do echo themselves. Some information is better than no information. And we're also uh, reaching out to general practitioners to uh, come along to our department to get trained in echo so that they can also use similar systems in the community to at least find out if they have a normal heart. Uh, and that is possible. Uh, if so, and that is how we are addressing the, the, the issue at WICATO. I'm sure others are coming up with other innovative strategies and we'd love to learn from that too. What advice would you give primary care rehypertension, especially as people with hypertension have worse outcomes? I'm concerned hypertension undertreated generally while having a systolic over 150 on a regular basis. Yes, COVID has put another spin to hypertension. Uh, everybody is worried about hypertension, particularly when uh, it is linked to ACE2 receptors and the spike protein that the, the virus uh, attaches itself to before it gets in, into the cells. But there is absolutely no evidence so far to suggest that they should either stop ACE inhibitors or ACE2 and uh, ACE receptor antagonists. Um, so patients should be treated as they would do, as they would uh, as a, a general practitioner or a specialist should do normally, and, and they should continue with ACE inhibitors. Even and in fact, there are other viral infections where ACE inhibitors have been found to be protective. So we are still trying to learn from all of this. The data, uh, both molecular medicine data and clinical data, is coming in every day. So uh, I don't think it is, there is evidence to suggest we should either change our practice or modify our practice in terms of antihypertensive treatment. 
Okay, we've got, it seems that the pandemic has really allowed us to truly think about patient-centered care, i.e. hospitals working more collaboratively with community providers, quicker appointments and on time, less waiting times. Do you have any further thoughts on this? Yes, so again, again collaboration is key. Uh, there are lots of patients who are uh, in our waiting list to come up for a first specialist appointment. Uh, previously, general practitioners would have sent the patient uh, or, or after a few tick boxes directly to a specialist. Now they are thinking differently. Specialists are thinking differently. Specialists are actively giving phone numbers to GPs so that they can call directly to get specialist advice rather than going through a junior doctor or registrar and then end up ending up having a written or a verbal communication. So over the lockdown period, for example, cardiologists were rostered to answer calls from specialists in our department. So that means we are now reaching out to community practitioners uh, to, to help each other. That's fantastic. Hey, I think that will really help moving things forward. And it, it, gets, it gets everyone on the same page rather than having all these different loops to jump through to get one answer. Yeah. So we've got with the newly written protocols to guide treatment, were there any COVID positive patients treated in the cath lab? And if so, what was the outcome? Um, we had uh, written protocols. Absolutely, uh, for code yellow, code orange, code red, and we had escalated up to code orange. Uh, luckily, there weren't any patients who had code positive and had STEMI and ended up treating in the cath lab. We had suspected COVID, and that, of course, um, had uh, we were all um, appropriately uh, protected for, that, uh, for treating that patient. But more importantly, we had um, just, just after, uh, oh, actually just before the lockdown, we had implemented and trained staff uh, across the hospital, uh, but more so uh, specifically for cath labs uh, from experience from colleagues uh, from overseas. Um, and that was very helpful because New Zealand came in late. We, we, were, not, we were not caught off, off guards, luckily. Uh, as I said, many of my own uh, friends and colleagues um, had a COVID uh, infection and some of them, uh, luckily, uh, some of them sadly are not here with us today. In, the, in that sense, uh, New Zealand uh, is very lucky. And we also were uh, lucky because we started training early on. Yeah, yeah, I think everyone's been affected in some way. Eh? Um, we've just seen on the news, robotype virtual surgery. Is this happening in New Zealand, social distancing and medicine? <laughs> uh, well, no, it's a short answer. For example, today, I, I, I was in CT scan after a complication in the, in the cat lab. The, 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 the entire CT scan room was full of people. Uh, yeah, the, the, we, the, there were people in the, in the, in the room com commenting about social distancing, but when you have an emergency and the patient is sick, uh, there is no social distancing. We have to treat what we have to treat. Uh, but yeah, uh, this is a serious concern. And again, we are very lucky that we don't have to walk around the hospitals with uh, full PPE gear because the community transmission in New Zealand is uh, virtually zero. Yep, touch wood on that one. <laughs> um, so someone's saying, can you please explain the pathophysiology of the link between COVID and CVD? Um, we don't, I don't, um, I have to say. Um, and uh, again, the data and science is emerging. Uh, the only, only thing that we, we, we have so far is the link of ACE receptor uh, to COVID. Um, and I'm sure there will be lots more coming out of this uh, over the next uh, uh, few few months. But every day we are getting um, new um, evidence. Even if you were to look at uh, echocardiography evidence, almost every pathology described so far has been linked to COVID on, on a previously healthy patient. So I've been following this uh, for the last few, few months. 
uh, from uh, from January onwards, actually, uh, and we can see different pathology uh, identified on echocardiography on a seemingly completely normal patient before, and attributed to COVID. So we don't know why would some patients have pericardial effusion, other patients don't. Why would some patients have uh, ST elevation in fact when the arteries are completely normal? Uh, we are still finding out. So how common do you think the heart complications are in a healthy patient? Have you had anything come through yet on that? Yeah, I would say if there are confirmed COVID and if they're, they've got troponin positive, um, then almost certainly they will have some kind of cardiovascular involvement. So we were bracing ourselves to almost 30% uh, of patients with COVID ending up in, in CCU. Um, and hence we had uh, taken very active uh, precautions and concentrations into how we organize ourselves. So this is a, a real problem. And I'm sure if at all it comes back, hopefully it never does. If it does, then we have to be very vigilant. Yeah. What are your views on taking aspirin for 50 year plus people as a preventative measure to lower risk of PE DVT if exposed to COVID? <laughs> Um, again, uh, if there are, <laughs> there, there's, there's very little science to it, to be fair. But more importantly, if you have, if one has COVID confirmed, um, then, uh, then you, 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 one has to be careful, especially if they're troponin positive. Uh, they're troponin negative for, for sure. Yeah, it's like any other viral infection. Hopefully, it settles down. Um, whether there, and, and for patients who are in hospital or who receive hospital, who need hospital level care, um, the risk of pulmonary venous thromboembolism is very high, particularly PE. Uh, I'm not sure whether we have any studies suggesting aspirin is going to stop that process. Uh, yeah. This one's a little bit along, just fits in with what you're saying about with being careful. It's got your comments around troponin. How can we differentiate them between known positive COVID and new STEMI, non-STEMI, i.e. pathways for pre-hospital thrombolysis currently may not cover this, um, but like mm -hmm. the troponin rise with a history of CKD? Uh, we can't. Uh, that is the issue. Uh, so there, as I said, there are several case reports showing uh, there is ST elevation in, uh, in myocardial infarction or up, what appears to be ST elevation myocardial infarction with classic tests and ECG changes and completely normal coronary arteries. Um, and then a couple around rheumatic heart disease. So in high comorbid communities with rheumatic heart disease, what is the forecast for these patients getting COVID-19, i.e. heart valve disease? Um, yeah, so that's the first one. So uh, again, from anecdotal evidence, we, we feel any patient with uh, heart disease um, tend to have a higher predisposition to this virus infection. Um, and, and that's all we have. We, the, we, there, is no, uh, any further, there is no further categorization of whether uh, patients with valve diseases uh, has higher risk or patients with heart failure has higher risk or patients with arrhythmia has higher risk. But I would, say, I, I would have thought anyone who has uh, cardiovascular comorbidities um, will be at a higher risk. And it is an imp this is an important consideration, particularly uh, for uh, remote um, communities, um, uh, indigenous communities, uh, where uh, rheumatic heart disease is prevalent. Um, and I think it's a little step back from that is another one being is should we even do throat swabs for strep A? Shouldn't we just treat for antibiotics for 10 days, especially in high risk communities? Yeah, uh, that, is a, that is a very, very valid uh, point. Uh, on that note, we have, uh, we have assigned a cardiologist specifically for rheumatic heart disease, rheumatic carditis in the department. Um, because we are, this is, uh, is, is potentially a third world disease. We still seem to have it in New Zealand. We have to work together, uh, both specialists and GPs and community nurse specialists. 
um, to to get to the bottom of it. Uh, and um, and in Midland region, uh, particularly, um, I, I'm in, in many ways involved in the in the regional programs, and this will be a focus for the Mid Midland region to help uh, create awareness of rheumatic heart disease, and hopefully um, get to the bottom of it. And then we've got three questions here, all along a similar sort of line. So I'll try and put them together for you. Um, so it's about getting people to help early about how we encourage them back to clinics. But more so than that, another one is saying that there's been stories in the media of a lot of people having died at home from heart disease and stroke because they've been too scared to come to hospital. Do you think this has happened in New Zealand? Absolutely. I've got uh, experience from my own uh, department where patients have come late, uh, where we were called in to see these patients uh, with heart failure. And the, 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 they were the young patients, Maori patients, who, who told me in person that they could not get to hospital early now because they could, they could, they could not seek help. Um, it's very sad, and we could not treat that patient uh, because uh, it was all a bit too late, and the patient died. Uh, and this, this is common, absolutely. It, it, if it has happened in Waikato, I'm sure it has happened across the country. If it has happened in the hospital, I'm sure it has happened outside the hospital too, perhaps more so than what has happened in the hospital. Uh, and hence, we are having this discussion. And then we've got, oh, you froze. <laughs> Can you please comment on arterial waveform as a novel predictor of CV risk? <laughs> um, Again, these are these are very topical uh, discussions. Uh, the, the, there are several variables that are out there, uh, trying to understand whether there is a, whether a patient is at risk or not so much. Um, and there are several manufacturers who are trying to um, get um, on this bandwagon and perhaps uh, uh, be uh, be trendy. Uh, but again, uh, science on this is uh, little, uh, but I would say emerging. Uh, I'm sure there will be a, a smart way of predicting COVID, but a wearable um, market, uh, both consumer level uh, wearables and, uh, and health uh, and specialist tailored wearables uh, will be the new norm. Uh, so looking at undiagnosed heart disease, what is the best way to inform people about symptoms so they actually know to go to their doctor? So again, awareness uh, at, at, at several levels um, at, uh, at, in, in the communities. And, and hence, we are trying to uh, come up with a strategy whether with community layers and nurse specialists who are going out to the communities who who would uh, previously have never uh, got an opportunity to speak with health specialists or healthcare professionals to encourage them to be uh, to to open up and encourage them to seek help um, I, I think the model of care in new zealand so far has been a, a top down model where specialists talked about disease uh, we have to rethink how we uh, deliver healthcare by taking healthcare to the people who need it most rather than waiting for the patients to turn up. And that's one of the downsides I've, I've noticed most personally about COVID testing, for example. We waited for patients to go to the testing centers. Even my own colleagues could not get it tested because they didn't meet the criteria and they were sent back. So I would argue that the, the healthcare community should hopefully take our services to patients in the community. Yeah. yeah, fair call. And so here we are then. So can echo be done in a virtual setting, patient far away from the cardiologist? Absolutely. And then hence, I'm inviting GPs to come to our department to get trained in echo. Uh, but it has to, so far, we, we don't have a patch that will sit in our, in our uh, precordium and then give us images uh, remotely. That, has not, that technology is not there yet. However, uh, it, it can be done uh, by a non-cardiologist, so to speak. Um, it can be interpreted by a person who is trained to, do, uh, trained to look at images. After all, medicine is about pattern recognition. You, you see it a thousand times, the next time you see uh, that's what it is. 
Yeah, it's quite interesting. We just got a thing called Rita, and Rita is all on wheels, and she's got eyes and ears, and they can zoom into the finest detail on the patient. So they can seemingly do it from their mobile phones down at the main hospital, and they can come right in. <laughs> so watch the space. You might get your echoes by the same thing eventually. Eh? Get, get a Rita that's got arms that can move around and, <laughs> and do it. Um, so have you seen any cardiac complications related more to anxiety and stress emphasized by COVID? I have not seen myself uh, the stress related, uh, related to COVID causing cardiac disease. Uh, luckily in New Zealand, we don't have, we didn't have so many patients all at the, uh, at the same time. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it is, it is possible. Now we're moving into echo land. Can nurses not be trained in echo? Anybody could be trained in echo, so long as they understand what they're looking at. Uh, and, um, uh, I, I, and again, it is, about, it is about getting experience in not only seeing what they need to see, but interpreting what they see. Uh, and that is where it is easier on a larger scale for GPs to do uh, to learn echo, so that they can not, not only do the echo and interpret what they see, and with the clinical findings uh, or the clinical history they've taken. Absolutely, nurse practitioners who are in cardiology world can be trained to interpret and and read and understand and then uh, act on what they find. But nurse practitioners is not easy to find, particularly in cardiology. So therefore, but I, I would prefer this technology to move into general practice, not necessarily be within cardiology. It has to be used by, by it is a very easily reproducible, non-invasive test. So it could be, it should be uh, performed by anybody who has an interest in this. And so someone's asking on that point, how to apply for the ECHO training program for GPs? <laughs> you just well, set up a new business now. <laughs> again, I, I, at Waikato, we are we are writing protocols. We have reached out to community uh, community practitioners uh, in Midland region. We reached out to medical directors of uh, large PHOs um, about this program. Uh, um, uh, so we are in the in the final stages of uh, getting that uh, up and running. Mm -hmm. And then, um, do they have a subsidized way of getting out, getting the ultrasounds? Uh, you mean the machine, or you mean the scan, or? I was, yes, I would imagine you mean in the scanners. You'd have to, surely you'd be thinking about the ultrasound scanners. That question. Well, every. It's all right. You give them the training, but they've got to have the equipment and their practice to do it. <laughs> So every um, vendor, Philips and Siemens and GE, everyone has got this COVID machine these days. So yeah, it is a, it is a, a portable machine that one could have. I'm not 100% sure about the subsidies and the, 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 the price points of these, because that, that's something that I don't deal with at the hospital myself. Uh, <laughs> but, 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 more, but what is important though is it is uh, a, a equipment that is uh, that is not prohibitively expensive as it used to be. Uh, a, a, a simple machine that can do 2D uh, is enough to get important information which we would not have had otherwise. And a few people have picked up on your comments around swabbing. And so one's asking, um, should all healthcare workers, even ones in Maori organizations, get tested for COVID-19 due to their close interactions with their community, even if they're asymptomatic? And then we've got, there was another couple around the swab and one. Um, are all healthcare workers encouraged or required to have COVID testing? And again, commenting about the asymptomatic. Um, Yes, go for it. Um, yes, uh, several series uh, uh, in different countries have, have uh, shown almost up to 30 to 40 percent of patients can potentially be asymptomatic. Um, and that is particularly so for younger patients. 
Um, no, it is not a mandatory requirement for healthcare professionals in New Zealand, at least, to get uh, tested. However, over the last two or three weeks, uh, we have been um, uh, randomly testing people walking down the corridor uh, for COVID. Uh, over a, if this gets, um, if this comes back, uh, another peak comes back. I'm hoping there will be. Uh, uh, rapid test is uh, available, um, and that will make life far easier. Uh, we don't have that right now. It, it still takes almost 24 hours uh, at the very least to get a reasonable answer. But then again, there are several tests across the world, and several of them are false positive and false negative. It is important to have a consistent testing system in New Zealand. Um, you may have heard there is a new app that is released from the health ministry. And these are important things to uh, to identify contact tracing uh, for for the disease. And so we've got someone saying to just they love that I love this I love that this is almost forcing us to rethink how we deliver healthcare in New Zealand. Taking services to the people in the community is absolutely where it needs to be. And then we've got another one here that's saying, "Great to see your analysis that does this." This, this, oh, I can't get, changes the presentation by ethnicity. There are many barriers, not just patients not knowing. Also ambulance triage when people understate symptoms, minimizing responses. Um, are you going to research the barriers? Seems a unique opportunity to better understand systemic barriers that become worse with COVID. Uh, yes, uh, that is a step too far. I don't understand the problem right now. In fact, the hospital does not understand the problem right now. Uh, so there, is, there are projects going on from my department trying to understand the real problem, trying to understand the, uh, the, um, the, ethnic, uh, the ethnicity representation of the different treatments we provide. For example, I specialize in transcatheter aortic valve implantation procedures and such. For, uh, in my own program, uh, we, have, we treat uh, less than 10% of patients who are Maori, for example. Majority of patients who, who we treat are privileged white men. That's probably because they're all, the very few patients um, who are referred to our specialist service uh, are Maori, or perhaps patients don't uh, get to the age where we would consider them for uh, minimally invasive treatment. Uh, but these are important con uh, considerations that we have to first identify the, the extent of the problem and then understand the barriers to this problem and then perhaps fix that barrier. And, and one of the ways we are doing this is to have uh, uh, a prospective collection of data from uh, Maori liaison special nurse specialists and also to understand our own uh, procedure track record. Um, so there are projects going on from my department looking at this. Uh, right now, and hopefully over the next uh, year or so, we will have more uh, concrete answers to these and hopefully uh, have suggestions to uh, improve uh, how we treat patients. And I've just got somebody saying, roll on antibody testing for COVID perhaps, but then still no guarantees of this with no infection either. And then we've got, we've got what is the shortest pathway you suggest for a patient diagnosed with cardiac disease to get to point of treatment? It depends on what cardiac disease it is. Uh, if it is a, a emergent cardiac disease, the shortest treatment is to seek is to speak to the cardiologist in a, in a, in a, in a tertiary center or in a secondary center. If it is something that you can be treated in the community, then there are guidelines that there are guidelines sent through or uh, shared from uh, societies within New Australia and New Zealand, uh, which gives uh, which is not too far different from the American or the European guidelines. Um, so, so, so that the, the and, and there are also um, treatment pathways written. Uh, in the different regions. Uh, for example, Midland region has a treatment pathway that is shared amongst the GPs and so would be other, other regions also similar uh, pathways. And th I think that is the best way of, get of getting um, cardiology input for patients. 
in the pre-hospital environment, are patients that present with STEMI and have COVID symptoms still eligible to be thrombolized pre-hospital? Has the criteria changed? No, criteria has not changed. We, we still recommend uh, thrombol thrombolysis, particularly if patients can't get to a PCI capable center in a reasonable time frame. And then, so in terms of outlook, does it, is it implied that the closer you live to a cath, um, cath lab in COVID-19 times, the higher your survival rate? Unfortunately, yes. Yeah. That is, that is the reality. Fortunately, and then we've got, should we be worried about Kawasaki's disease in New Zealand? Again, luckily, the, the infection uh, rate, at least the, the ones that we know of, is not as high as it is in other countries. I'm hoping uh, this, will, this, will be this, this will continue to remain the same, and therefore Kawasaki's disease may not be a problem, or certainly it's secularly may not be a problem long term. And then we've just got this more of a comment and a question. And I think you've covered it quite well, but I think they're more acknowledging what you said. Many Maori are afraid of the hospital setting or have had, un or have had previous unpleasant hospital experience. So this won't get better until services go to them. But that's what you were saying before about getting people out into the communities and actually. Uh, and again, uh, uh, for, for example, uh, we have uh, put in a proposal for an uh, echosonographer uh, to go into the community. Uh, first of all, the specialist nurse goes there, identify, works with the GP, identifies patients who are at, at need, and then uh, the echosonographer goes along with the portable echo machine to help, at least in the, in, the, in, the, in the time being. And then just a comment, great messages about collaborating with the wider workforce. Um, yeah, and look at that, you got through 41, oh, one more, 41 questions. Oh, this is a comment. Fantastic. <laughs> so thank you very much for the time this evening. You've given a whole heap of information. And I think it's probably been really fantastic for people to have access to you this evening to just pose the questions that at the moment are maybe not got readily available answers on the internet or through sources. Because as you say, it's evolving all the time. People are learning new information. So you know, that was absolutely, yeah. Amazing. Thank you very much for your time this evening.